Hi guys, thank you very much for coming tonight. My name is Laurie Miratori Pyres. Miratori wasn't long enough, I had to add Pyres to it. But I appreciate you all coming out this evening. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the hats in my collection, as well as a little bit of history on a few different hats. Um, I started collecting when I was 11 years old. I read a story about a boy that always wore a different hat, and I thought that was kind of interesting. So then my family, we took a trip to Disney, and my parents bought me Mickey Mouse ears. I didn't bring them tonight, because I think everybody knows what Mickey Mouse ears look like. But I decided then that that was going to be the first hat in my collection. And now, over, let's say, 40 years later, I have over 500 pieces. Hats first came about to protect us from the elements. The first drawing of a hat, they date back to 3100 BC on a tomb wall in Egypt. And it's a drawing of a man wearing a conical shaped straw type hat, like you'd see someone wearing in the rice fields. It's, a, it's called a coolie. Then they discovered in 1991, they found Otzi the Iceman thawing from in between a crevice in the Italian Alps. And Otzi the Iceman was dated back to between 3100 and 3400 BC. And the reason I tell you this is because he was wearing a bearskin hat. So the, as you can see, hats have been along, around for a very long time. And again, initially they were to protect you from the elements, the wind, the rain, the snow. But over time, they've come to represent fashion or style or just fun. When my kids were growing up, this was always their favorite hat because it did this. <laughs> so hats also, of course, represent ranks in the military. They also represent occupations. The, um, remember when all the McDonald's workers wore these? Or the nurses wore these? We also had, of course, I have the conductor's hat. This police officer's hat is badge number four. The gentleman was an officer in Wareham in the 1940s. His daughter is here. Excuse me, everybody. Oh, where is she? Right up there in the back in the pink. Carol Vecchio? Yep. Thank you very much. I just saw her. Yep. I appreciate that. That's a friend of my mom's, and that's my mom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now you all know. <laughs> the, um, the mail carrier's hat. I'm a mail carrier by trade. And I like to point out the fireman's helmet. The fireman's helmet, although the material has changed over the years, the design of the helmet has stayed the same. It was specifically made this way with the elongated back that dropped down. These men and women are out doing such a difficult job. This style of helmet helps to protect the back of their necks from the snow or the rain from going down on the back of their collars. Now, I often wish as a mail carrier, we had their designer on our side. As you all know, our model, right? Rain, wind, snow, we get one of these. So not a lot of protection back there. The weather we've had lately, I think they should issue us these. And who'd have thought, I mean, for years I had this cute little black cat hat. Now, dye it pink, it becomes a political statement makes the front page of Time Magazine. Before I go into some of the history, I'd like to tell you one of the stories how I got my French mail carrier's hat. A few years ago, my daughter and I were taking a vacation in France, and I brought with me a hat from the United States hoping I could trade it for a French mail hat. So we went into a French post office, of course, and I asked the clerks if there was a mail carrier there. And they said, no, nope, they don't work in this building. And I said, oh, and I told them I was looking to get one of their hats. That's impossible. They're not allowed to sell or transfer any part of their uniform. It's in the manual, it's just not allowed. OK, a few days later, we went to another post office. Basically the same story. I said I was looking for a hat. Not possible. It's in the manual, not allowed. All right, the last day of the trip. 
My daughter says, Mom, there's a mail carrier coming down the hill towards us, but I don't see a hat. I said, oh, I see it. It's in his cot. So I went up to him, and I can speak a little bit of French. So I said, bonjour, je suis un facteur et uni, which is, hi, I'm a mail carrier in the United States. Well, he gave me a hug, a kiss on each cheek. He thought I was his long-lost sister. I then told him I would love the hat, his hat, for my collection. Well, he obviously didn't read the manual. <laughs> right in and gave me his hat. So I then gave him the USA hat because it's just as a thank you to him. Now twice more during the day my daughter and I were walking around once shopping and once having lunch and there's the French mail carrier in his uniform. We're in the United States of America. <laughs> So that's one of the reasons I still collect hats, because some of the stories are just fun. The other reason is the history involved. My dad was a huge history buff, and he kind of forced us to learn history over the years. But now I'm grateful for that. And um, I'm going to talk a couple of different hats throughout history. The first one is known as the, the newsboy, the scally cap, uh, the flat cap. This style of a hat, I see this gentleman has one on. Uh, this style of hat has been around since the 1300s. Now in 1571, Parliament passed a law that every male over the age of six had to wear a woolen cap on Sundays and holidays. Uh, otherwise they would face a fine. Except, of course, for nobility. They didn't have to wear one. But the reason was to promote the wool trade. And this law stayed on the books for about 26 years. And after that, it was repealed. But by then, <coughs> the gentlemen liked wearing this style of hat. They got used to it. There was a sense of camaraderie for them. So they continued wearing them. Now, when the Irish immigrants came to America, they brought this style of hat with them. A lot of the Irish worked along the shipyards and the docks, and they started getting into some trouble with drinking and fighting. So people began referring to them in a derogatory term. They called them scallywags. So the scallywags wore scally caps. So we know what you're all about over there. <laughs> now, the next style of hat, which is one of my favorites, is the top hat. In 1793, there was a gentleman, the last name of Dunnage. And Mr. Dunnage designed a top hat style of hat, but nothing really came about from that until 1797, when Mr. Hethington, who was a hatter in London, hatters, by the way, make men's hats, and milliners make women's hats. So he, um, Mr. Hethington designed a top hat, and he wore it down the main streets of London. Now, he caused such a commotion wearing this type of object that he was stopped by a police officer and fined for disturbing the peace. <laughs> but meanwhile, there was a gentleman that caught the whole thing and he wrote the article up on the, he was a reporter, and he wrote the article up on the front page of the London Times. The rest, as they say, is history. Anyone that was anyone had to have a top hat. Now the way we walk out of the house with shoes and socks, up until, the, up until the 60s, people wouldn't leave without a hat on their head. And I have to give a special thank you to Jack sitting here, and Sheila, his wife, because Jack gave me this hat, and although I had another top hat, Jack gave me this amazing, I'm not gonna talk it up too much because he'll want it back. <laughs> but he gave me this amazing leather hat box just to show you what people went through to travel with the hats. And this dates to about the 1800s. Jack got that, now my mom turned 80 last Sunday, and Jack and Sheila graduated high school with her. So I'm not gonna say their age, but it gives you an idea how long that's been around. <laughs> Jack got that as a boy on his paper route from one of his customers and had it ever since. And in the last few years, Sheila keep tell kept telling him, when are you going to move that off the dining room table? When are you going to get that off the dining room table? <laughs> so I don't know who was happier, me that I got it or her that she got rid of it. <laughs> but thank you. Now, the top hat. I mean, think in history of all the people that wore top hats. 
every single U.S. president up until Kennedy, excluding Eisenhower before him, wore a top hat for their presidential inauguration. Now, our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, he, as you all know, you always saw a lot of photographs with him wearing top hats. There's three basic styles, the short John Bull, and this, this size style is called the chimney pop, and then there's also the stovepipe, which is the tallest of the three. That's the one Lincoln chose to wear. Now, President Lincoln was a lawyer by trade and used to put his important papers up inside his hat. In 1865, when he was assassinated, the War Department took over a lot of his belongings from that night. And after about two years, with his wife's Mary's permission, they donated the hat to the Smithsonian Institute. But the secretary at the Smithsonian was nervous about putting it out on display. He felt two years wasn't long enough, it would still fresh in people's minds. And he put it in a basement closet. And it sat there for 26 years until someone from the Lincoln Memorial wanted to do an exhibit and they borrowed the hat. Then afterwards they returned it to the Smithsonian where it is on permanent display today. Um, on September 2nd, 1945, when the Japanese boarded the USS Missouri to sign their surrender papers after World War II, every non-military member of the Japanese delegation wore a top hat. J.P. Morgan had a special built limousine so he could ride around in it wearing his top hat. <laughs> and Uncle Sam wears a top hat. And of course, you can't forget the Mad Hatter. Yeah. Now, if you're ever in a trivia game and they ask you the numbers on the side of the hat, 10 over 6, that's not his hat size. That was supposedly the price. He paid 10 shillings and 6 pence for his hat. Now, the term, Matt is a hatter, I'm sure a lot of you have heard that term, that dates back to Turkey when hatters were, believe it or not, they were, they were using, for a cheap fiber, they were using camel fur. And to cure that, to make the fibers bind tighter together, they were treating it with camel urine. I'm waiting for the uhs. Okay. <laughs> so that process went over to England and over to, to Europe. And at a, eventually, the hatters began using their own urine. So at one point in time, there was one factory that the management noticed this one worker, well, I see the face, <laughs> this one worker was working at a much faster rate. His, his fibers were binding a lot quicker. And when they investigated, they found out that he was being treated for syphilis. And one of the components in his medication for syphilis was a form of mercury. So out with the urine, in with the mercury. Now these hatters, they're working in buildings without windows. There's no ventilation. The fumes are all around. They're slowly being poisoned by the mercury. They're showing signs of dementia. They're shaking and, and forgetting things. So hence the term, mad as a hatter. Now, in around 1814, there was a magician named Louis Comte in England. And Mr. Comte owned his own theater. He also did shows for the king. And that would be the first time he would use noted as being one of the first people to ever use a top hat in his show and say, oh, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. <laughs> you didn't know it was going to be magic at this show, did you? <laughs> so, moving along. That was in 1814. In 18... Let me think a second. 1840. 1840. 1840, there was a gentleman named Antoine Gibbous. And Mr. Gibbous loved this top hat. But it was rather cumbersome to go to the opera or to the theater wearing a top hat. You had to always hold the hat on your lap for the whole performance. So Mr. Gibbous modified the top hat and he put metal springs inside. And of course that became known as the opera hat or the gibbous. And you could then go to the show, collapse your hat and slide it under your seat. And in addition to that, um, he also Okay, no, he didn't do anything, hold on. <laughs> Not, we're switching hats. That was, 
the collapsible top hat, Mr. Givis. But 1849, there was a landowner, a wealthy politician. What politician isn't wealthy? <laughs> and he was in England, and he employed quite a few men. They would ride his lands and fix the fences and mend to the livestock. But the problem was he wanted his men dressed properly. And part of that attire was to wear a top hat. But the top hats were getting knocked off by the branches, trampled by the horses. He was constantly replacing them. So he decided to go to Lock and Company, which is the oldest hat company in the world, and is still in existence today on St. James Street in London. And he told the owners of Lock and Company he wanted a hat with a shorter crown, sturdy, it would fit much tighter on his riders' heads. They gave the job to a couple of brothers whose last name was Bowler. And the Bowler was born. It's also referred to as a derby because at the time, if you went to the horse races, you would just see seas of this style of hat, so they called them derbies. Um, now, this style of hat was popular for well over 70 years. And it, unlike the top hat, which was for the upper class, this was more for any, anyone, the middle class, even some of the lower class, they wore derbies. This style you'd see on Bat Masterson, you'd see it on um, Butch Cassidy, You'd, on bankers, if you look at the old Western movies, you'll see the bankers and the shopkeepers, the bartenders, they're not wearing cowboy hats. Stetson didn't invent that till 1865. So this is only 1849. This was called actually the hat that won the West. <laughs> now this style of hat, which I thought was a funny story, around 1924, there were some railroad workers from England working in Bolivia, putting in railroads. Um, they were sent shipments of derbies, bowlers, to help protect them from the sun. When they got the shipments, they were all too small. So it's not like you had a return policy or Amazon, you could ship them back. <laughs> so they had crates of derbies. Well, what do you do with them? So they started the rumor, they told the women in the area that this was high fashion in England. <laughs> and if you, to this day, if you look up the, I'm sorry for pronunciation, but Kuichuin, it's a, the group of women in Bolivia, they have the beautiful dresses and the colorful skirts, and they're all wearing derbies. What about women's fashion? Women, Predominantly until this era, in the 1600s, 1700s, there were a lot of scarves, a lot of bonnets, nothing too fancy. It was with things they could make in their own homes. And um, of course the bonnets would have different colored patterns or different materials. They also had, in the 1600s, 1700s, women had very tall, powdery wigs, tall hairstyles. So in addition to the bonnets, they had what was called a calash. And I wish I had one of these. But this, this calash, it's kind of like the hood of a baby carriage. In fact, the, um, the curator for, uh, for New England, all of historic New England, told me that they had one of these in their collection in their building in Haverhill. And it wasn't until some woman, some woman was in the building going to another department when she noticed a collage in a whole other area. It wasn't in with the clothing or the hats. And she asked her why it was in that department. And the curator said, well, it's the hood to a baby carriage, but we don't have the baby carriage. She said, no, it's a bonnet. And um, so they were amazed because they used, I mean, this, again, it was dated to like 16, late 1600s. They would use whalebone and wood to, to make it stand up so it would go over the woman's hair. But that was a pretty amazing piece. Now, the um, women in this time were also wearing straw hats. In 1798, there was a 12-year-old girl named Betsy Metcalf. And Betsy Metcalf lived in Rhode Island, and she passed by a store window, and she saw an imported straw hat from Europe. And she fell in love with it, but she was 12 years old. She couldn't afford to buy it. So Betsy got some, some oats, some straw from out in the fields and taught herself how to weave a straw hat. Now she took this, 
idea of hers. And she wore her hat to school, and her, her classmates loved it. So she taught them how to do this. Now, a lot of them, they lived in, a lot of her friends that went to a day school came from Foxborough, Massachusetts. And if anyone's ever heard, Foxborough, Massachusetts was once known as the straw hat capital of the world. And it all started with a 12-year-old girl named Betsy Metcalf. Now, in 19... Oh, you know, give me 1910, because actually, it's 110 years ago this month was the first patent granted to a woman, and it was for weaving straw to make hats. There was a woman named Mary Kleiss, and she lived in Connecticut. And, and um, because Betsy never patented her idea, she said that she didn't want Congress to know her name. <laughs> but for whatever reason, Mary patented, patented the, the idea and um, is in, in the books for becoming the first woman with a U.S. patent, and that's what it was for. And also in the late 1800s, there was a couple of cousins named Hall and Hemingway were their last names. And Miss Hemingway had read an article how birds were being decimated for the millinery trade, especially in New York and in London. You could walk down two blocks of New York streets, and in all the storefronts, you would see the plumage from the birds, as well as whole birds. In Florida alone, in one year, they wiped out 95% of the white egret population just for millinery reasons. So Ms. Hall and Ms. Hemingway got together, and they began hosting tea parties, trying to convince their friends to stop buying hats with feathers. And a lot of women joined the group. A lot of women wanted nothing to do with it. But because of their efforts, we got the Migratory Bird Treaty. They also formed the National Audubon Society, which became, uh, they formed the Massachusetts Audubon Society, which became eventually the National Audubon Society. 1911 is when women wore the largest brim-styled hats. Again, some still used feathers. <clears throat> now, in the late 1800s, there was a play written for an actress named Sarah Bernhardt. She was a, a theater actress, very famous at the time. And Miss Bernhardt, in the play, put on a soft, felt-styled hat. Her name in the play was Princess Fedora. So the fedora was first made and marketed for women, not men. It wasn't until 1924, when a prince in England began wearing a fedora-style hat, that the men began to emulate him, and it took off in popularity for men. There's a, just a quick picture here from 1919 that shows all the gentlemen wearing the straw hats. Just to give you an idea. I mean, you just, oh, yeah, right? <laughs> um, now, there were a couple of famous designers at this time, too. But, uh, oh, 1920, 1920, women earned the right to vote. They're starting to feel more liberated and progressive. So they start to cut their hair short. And to go along with the short hairstyle, they begin to wear Shorter hats, thank you, Nancy. <laughs> um, these hats, the, the close style, or just a small style of hat, it went along with this short hairstyle. Now, the women are wearing these are into the Roaring Twenties. The men are wearing the fedoras predominantly, and you associate them a lot with prohibition or with gangsters because we also get television, so people are seeing Cagney on TV, they're seeing, seeing Bogart, they're seeing Casablanca, um, the Rat Pack, James Dean. And, and these are the things that were keeping fedoras in the forefront and keeping that hat popular. But we hit the 19... Between the two world wars, 1928, and, not 19, well, around 1928, this is a designer. Her name was Elsa Schiaparelli. And Elsa Schiaparelli was one of the top designers between the two world wars. A lot of actresses and famous people had Schiaparellis. 
Now Elsa was born in Italy. She came to the United States. She got married and she got, she, they had a daughter and then she was divorced. So Elsa moved back to France and in the 20s she opened her shop. She didn't make just hats. She also made uh, dresses and other type of fashion. She was the first one to put colored zippers in women's dresses. So instead of a metal zipper, if you had a yellow dress, you had a yellow zipper. She also the first one to make split skirts, they called them, today's shorts. That was Elsa Schiaparelli. Now Elsa was very talented. She had a lot of high-end clients and she did a lot of work with um, different artists, in particular Salvador Dali. And she made a a funky hat, which basically is a high heel shoe upside down on the head. And it's actually in a museum in England. And then there's another one, I'm told, in New York, which I've yet to see, but I plan on getting there. Elsa Schiaparelli also, um, when a shop was in France, then France declared war on Germany, she moved back to the States. When the war was over, over time, she went back to France, but found out that her styles weren't really popular anymore. There was actually a new name on the scene, Christian Dior. And of course, up until the 50s too, Mr. Dior did a lot with turban styles in the 50s. Now, Elsa Schiaparelli, on a side note, she had a closer shop in the 50s, but in 2012, it was repurchased and back on the high fashion scene in Europe, in England, in, and in France. And she, her daughter had two daughters. Unfortunately, one of them didn't live long enough to see her grandmother's name brought back to life, if you will. She was vacationing down the Cape and was on a flight home to California when on September 11th, her plane hit the towers. And that was Elsa's granddaughter, one of her granddaughters. Another famous designer I like to show you guys is Mr. John. Now, Mr. John was known as the fashion designer to the stars. You know Mr. John, I see. All right. He was, although Elsa was closed in shop in the 50s, he was still very, very popular. In fact, he designed for Gone with the Wind, Greta Garbo, Vivian Leigh. These were Mr. John style hats. Now, Mr. John, he uh, was quoted as having said, I don't know what I'll do when I get to heaven because I don't think even I can improve on the halo. Oh. <laughs> and another Mr. John story, which I found amusing, he had a woman rush into his shop in New York and she was frantic. She needed a hat right away and she just needed it done immediately. So Mr. John actually built the pieces of the hat right then and there on top of her head. And then he told her the price, and she complained about the price. He said, hold on. He disassembled it. He handed her the pieces and said, $3.59, you build it. <laughs> I love that story. One more designer I'm going to mention, and this is, a, I really like this hat. I need the glasses for this one. But thank you, Mom. Mom got this at a yard sale a few years ago. This is an Ann Dinkin. Now, Ann Dinkin was a famous milliner. She worked for um, Bon Witt and Teller, which was a high-end department store in New York. And Ann was ma making her hats then, and her husband, after World War II, decided they were going to move to Japan. So they moved to Japan. And Anne was still selling her hats, and what's really cool about this one is it still has the brochure that Anne sent back to one of her clients in the United States, and she wrote on it, I can get you a fine bonnet, my love, if you'll choose the one you like. So for $18.50, including the airfare, the woman had checked off which one she wanted, sent it back, and Anne sent her the hat. Now, part of what I like about collecting hats, as I said, is looking into the history of them. But trying to find something about Ann Dinkin, all I could find was Jewish delicatessen owner. <laughs> Come to find out, same person. When she was in Japan, her and her husband got divorced in the 60s, and she needed to make some money, more than just selling her hats. 
So she decided she was going to open Japan's first Jewish delicatessen. <laughs> she did. It was very, very popular. And also, Anne got the exclusive rights to import pastrami. So she had no competition. <laughs> Now, we're talking into the 50s, and um, here's a picture of mom in the 50s. <laughs> Don't worry, I didn't bring the one in the 60s. Uh, this is, and my mom is in this picture, but it is, and it is from the 1950s. It's just to show you all, the children, the adults, everyone's wearing a hat. And they're going to the circus. <laughs> but yet, they're all dressed up in their finery and wearing their hats. So this was 1950s. So in the 50s, we were still loving our hats, having a good time. And then the 1960s hit. And it's rather a dismal time for headwear. Part of the blame men were putting Thank you, Ken and Gloria. <laughs> We're on President Kennedy. He was not a lover of hats. He wore his top hat for his inauguration, but after that, he just wasn't a fan. He had the president of the Hatters Union. He had the president of the hat company sending him hats on a weekly basis at one point, trying to get him to wear a hat. They had photographs of him sailing with his wind blowing, and his hair blowing in the wind, rather, and no hat. In fact, the, at a board meeting for, um, for a hat, the largest hat company, the um, chairman of the board was complaining because he was holding up newspaper articles, and they all showed President Kennedy without a hat, but yet he was complaining because Here's the Russian premier wearing a hat. How do we change this? <laughs> and that, that was a big deal. And this is a whole book about how he wouldn't wear a hat. And when he finally would, when he finally was on the, um, on the campaign trail and it started to rain at one point, and he ducked into a hat shop and he had to get a hat. And it made the front page of the paper. You know, Jack bought a hat. <laughs> but um, just wasn't a fan. Now, so 1960s, women start to tease their hair, color their hair. Hats, we've got a hairdresser over here. Hats and hairstyles have a direct correlation. Of course, you had the, the calash and the bonnets when the women had the tall hairstyles. They cut it short in the 20s, they wore the pillbox. Now their style is becoming their hair. They don't want a hat, they find them old fashioned. So, they're starting to stop wear hats. Men are still wearing some fedoras and it, because Indiana Jones is out. And he's Indiana Jones, you know, Harrison Ford. He's got a fedora, so the men are wearing fedoras. But the women, not so much. Then we hit 1970s, the lowest sales for hats in history. But 1980s, Princess Diana. She was a people person, and she loved her headwear. So a lot of the photographs are showing Princess Diana wearing hats. People are emulating her, and of course the fashion from Europe is coming over to the States, and people start wearing hats again. And you have TV shows like Mad Men or Downtown Abbey, and people are seeing the hats. So hats are back. I keep telling people hats are back, so come on, folks. <laughs> Um, 1970s, 1980s, okay, so a lot of magazines today, you will see women on the front page or throughout the articles, they're wearing hats, they're wearing the big fancy styles, they're high fashion in England, and I always say that hats are a great way to, to, to meet somebody, to start talking to somebody, um, to just, you know, a way to get the conversation going. And my kids and I, we were on a plane in New Zealand a couple of years ago, and the first thing I noticed about this guy on the seat behind me was the hat. Well, okay. <laughs> Wasn't the first thing I noticed, but eventually, ladies, you do notice the hat, right? Well, come to find out, he had no idea who the New England Patriots were. He lived in New Zealand. He bought it on sale in England, but it was a good conversation starter. <laughs> And I like to always point out that there's always room for one or two more hats. <laughs> and while we're looking at sports hats, this one, if anyone is a Patriots fan, 
Um, if you remember when the Patriots, before Kraft built the new stadium, they were going to move to St. Louis and become the St. Louis Stallions. Hmm. Well, the NFL, NFL tags on here, made up the hats hmm. for the St. Louis Stallions. Hmm. And they were supposedly destroyed, uh -huh. except for this one. Wow. <laughs> um, a friend of a friend. <laughs> But um, I'm holding out on this one because if you go to the Patriots, the, um, what's it called in Foxborough? Museum. Museum. Thank you, Richard. If you go to the Patriots Museum in Foxborough, they do have the stallion shirt, but they don't have the hat. So I'm waiting on season tickets for this one. <laughs> uh, another hat. I just picked this up Tuesday at the Brimfield Antique Show. Oh, yeah. And this was made by an Amish woman, and it start, it's all the sizes of the Amish bonnets for the young girl. This would be the infant, and then, of course, you know, you just, the little neck size up. The black means they're single, so if you see an um, Amish woman wearing a white hat or a white scarf type hat, she's married. Mm. But the black one denotes she's still single, except, of course, on an infant. But yeah, I thought these were pretty cool. So I got them Tuesday so I could come show them to you guys. Let's we'll see how long they last. <laughs> OK, now, another cool hat. This one here. Thank you, Richard. Um, I have a friend here who I work with that Thank you. Who takes care of an older gentleman that was in the Ringland Brothers Bonham and Bailey Circus. And no, this was not his hat. But this, uh, but again, doing the, it's molting, which is why I got it, which is why I'm going to put it back down. But um, inside the hat, it does have a tag stating what company made it. So I started researching the company and found out they do, they did hats for plays and they did on Broadway and for the Bonham Bailey Circus. And then I saw the woman's name in it. So I typed in the circus and the year and the 1940s. And I got the article. It shows a couple of twin sisters, the Hunt sisters. And there's a picture of them. And they're carrying hats that have like little green feathers in them. And they did acrobats and such for the circus. And that was one of their hats. If, uh, I don't know if anybody here is old enough to remember the college dink, the college beanie hat. <laughs> There's a time when freshmen had to wear these hats and they were quizzed by the upperclassmen about the school they were going to. But then um, a lot of gentlemen, of course, were going to war and they were coming home and with the GI Bill, they were going to college. There was no way they were gonna wear one of these. <laughs> <laughs> so this fashion discontinued. Now this, this is Uma's favorite hat. This is a Chinese Mao. This, this hat is all hand embroidered. The Mao girls at a very young age are taught this very intricate embroidery. And then the silver is all hand done. It's all hand hammered silver with usually birds and flowers because it's worn for fe uh, was fe bleh, festivals and for weddings. Now this hat, I'll share my story where I got it. When um, I had, had a couple of minor surgeries, appendix, gallbladder, and needless to say, I was missing some work, time at work. And so I didn't have a lot of money to spend, and two of my best friends decided they were going to take me to Martha's Vineyard for the day and cheer me up. So we went to the vineyard, and I saw this in the shop down on Edgartown. And I couldn't get in the store quick enough to take a look at it. I said, oh my god, I, I have to have this hat. And of course, being my two best friends, they talked me out of it. They said, look, you can't afford it. You, you don't have the money. OK, you're right. I didn't get it yet. <laughs> so I went home. And after three days of thinking about it, I called my boyfriend. And I said, uh, hey, you want to go to the vineyard for the day? <laughs> So he said yes, and of course we went to the store, and they had, they still had the hat, and 
I said to him, uh, oh, I love that hat. And he said, <laughs> he said the magic words that every girl wants to hear. Well, if you like it, buy it. <laughs> so I bought it, and then I'm telling this about this. I'm talking about this hat to a, a new shop on my mail route in Mansfield. This this woman opened a shop called Leaf Boutique. So I'm talking to Leaf. And I'm telling her about just a couple of the hats in my collection. And she said, I know the hat, and I know where you bought it. I said, how do you know that? It was her mother's shop. Oh. Right? I was like, wow. Uh, yeah, how that intertwines. Now, this one, this is from the 1800s. This is an Iroquois Indian, all hand beaded, and the Iroquois Indians would make this style of hat and then sell them to the tourists. A lot of them were sold up around Niagara Falls area. So late 1800s. If you jump back to the 60s for a minute, if any women remember you're too lazy to put a hat on, you wore a whimsy. And this is a whimsy. I see some nods over there. <laughs> Another cool item with hats, I think. This, this little item comes in a hat box. It's just a miniature version of the hat box. And you would give this to somebody as a gift. And when they open it, inside is a little miniature version of the hat that you paid for for them. This is back in like the 40s. It was called the salesman sample, but it's actually a gift certificate. And they would then take this hat to the hat shop and turn it in so they get one that fits. <laughs> Are we having fun, guys? Yes. All right. OK. Um, point out this one back here. This was in the movie Jewel of the Nile with Kathleen Turner and Michael Douglas. I thought that was kind of a cool hat. Well, I wished at the time I really wanted. They had the original Mary Poppins hat. And I, to this day, I still regret, but I didn't have $1,000 at the time, <laughs> but I could afford this one. <laughs> this one I picked up recently. The designer, is, her name is Donna Davis, and she makes everything out of metal and mesh. So it's kind of a cool little hat. And that was at the f um, Fashion School of Design in Boston. She was auctioning this off for a charity event. So I tell myself it was for charity. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of times you hear about fascinators. And fascinators are just, they're on like little headbands. And sometimes they're on clips. This one is a Sarah Havens. Sarah was out of Newport, Rhode Island. And then she moved down to Kentucky to make hats for the Derby. And let's see. Okay. Japanese World War II and Chinese military. My cousin Michael got me this. <laughs> this one here, this is one of my favorite hats also. <coughs> this is a German World War I. This is called a pickle hob which means pointed bonnet, basically, is what it translates to. It was artillery, and um, I'm sorry, this is infantry. If it had been artillery, it would have a ball on it, but this was infantry. It's engraved inside 1915 Berlin with the gentleman's initials, and it has a letter V, which stood for Vaughn, which meant it was probably worn by an aristocrat. I just, just love the style of that. Um, I think we're moving right around towards the end here, folks. Seeing if I missed anything. Oh, OK, yeah. One of my favorite designers from today, her name is Dina, but her brand is Chacha's House of Ill Repute. <laughs> That I was, it's what's, again, even the, in, even the inside of the hat is cool looking. <laughs> but uh, this, this is a cha-cha, she's really cool. When um, we went to the Hat Association dinner in New York, and I always say, yes, there is such a thing. And it's people that make the hat boxes and, of course, make the hats. 
And at the dinner, I was wearing a different, different uh, cha-cha hat, but I was wearing the hat, and this woman comes up to me and says, you're wearing one of my hats. And I'm like, oh my God, it's Dina. So I said, well, can you sign it? So she signed it for me, and then I met her again a couple years later at Salma Gundy, which is one of my favorite hat stores in Jamaica Plain, and there's one in Boston. And she signed this hat as well. And hold on, I'm trying to think if I missed anything here. Ah, okay. I saved my, I saved my. What's that, hon? Oh yeah, this is a, um, this is a Stetson. Everybody thinks you know Stetson cowboy hat, but they do make other styles of hats as well. That's why I brought this one. And you're gonna have to, if you want to see this after, you'd have to come up. I kept it closed because so you guys, it does have a little musty smell. But this trunk here oh. is from the 1800s. And it's like one of the coolest Christmas gifts. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> this, this hat trunk has six balls, if you will, built into it, probably made with straw. And the per you would put your hats into the trunk around the balls, and then you would spare them with these giant hat pins and hold them in place. It just goes to show you what they went through to transport their hats. I mean, this, this trunk, I've never seen anything like it. And the antiques dealer, who's been in business almost 50 years, said it's the only one he's ever seen. And um, it's just it's really amazing. It has the name Shaw on the side, and it says Cambridge. So I'd like, if anybody knows any Shaws in Cambridge, I'd like to find out more about that. And. One of my last stories, I like to save this one for last, because it's my favorite story. <coughs> it involves my dad. And if anybody here knew my dad, you know he was the symbol for if there's a will, there's a way. Now, dad was on vacation with mom. They were in Bermuda, uh, going back a very long time ago, so over 30 years ago, easily. and. Dad walked up to a Bermuda police officer, and he told him, or he asked him, where did you get your hat? And the police officer said, oh, well, those are issued to us, let's say Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith at the armory issues us these. Okay, so Dad hailed a cab, said, I need to go to the armory. And the cab driver said, well, I'm not allowed there, that's off limits. He said, well, how far can you get me? And the cabbie said, they'll probably get you to the gate. Dad said, okay, take me to the gate. So, off they go. Well, they get to the gate, and the, the security comes out with his machine gun and comes over, and my dad in the back seat putting down the window. And the security guy says, can I help you? My dad says, yes, Joe Muratori from the United States of America. I'm here to see Mr. Smith. <laughs> okay, well, okay, Mr. Muratori, they waved him in. <laughs> so, dad says he can see the cabbie perspiring on the back of his neck. <laughs> And he said, you know, the cabbie was telling him, I'm not supposed to be in here. And Dad said, they let us in. Don't worry about it. Okay. So they get up to the next gate, basically the same scenario. A gentleman comes out with his, his gun, and my dad's in the back seat. A Joe Miratori from the United States here to see Mr. Smith. Okay, Mr. Miratori, and they waved him in again. So now the cabbie's really kind of squirming in his seat there, but they get to the, the bottom of the building with all the stairs going up, and my, the cabbie's freaking out. My dad's telling him, relax. I'll make it worth your while. Just wait for me. Just wait right here. I'm going to go into the building. I'll be out soon. So cabbie waited. Dad went into the building. He went in to talk to the secretary, he said, Mr. Miratori, here is Mr. Smith, I'll have a seat, I'll let him know you're here. So a few minutes later, she comes out, she says, okay, Mr. Miratori, he'll see you now. Dad goes inside, they exchange pleasantries, and Mr. Smith says, well, what can I do for you? My dad says, well, I want to buy a police hat for my daughter's collection. <laughs> Mr. Smith says, what? <laughs> my dad says, I want to get a hat for my daughter. And Mr. Smith says, how did you get in here? <laughs> My dad says, so they waved me in at the gate. <laughs> so Mr. Smith said to him, for the sheer fact that you were able to get in here today in front of me, I'm going to get you a hat. I can't just hand it to you, but give me your itinerary, your, your flight home, and there will be a hat for you at customs. I'm going to write you out a slip for customs. So my dad said, oh, that's great. And of course, not being pushy at all, he said, he's going to have a badge and everything? <laughs> 
It's got to have a badge, Mr. Miratori. He says, okay, well, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Well, my dad says, well, what can I do for you? Oh, Mr. Miratori, you've done more than enough. You taught me I need to upgrade my security. <laughs> my favorite story and I leave you with one one word of advice if you're gonna go buy a hat which I strongly recommend do it when you're sober <laughs> otherwise you think this is a good idea <laughs>